tonight. Um, this is uh, Karen Sims with the Trauma and Resiliency Initiative for the See You Try show. Uh, I am so fortunate to have with me um, Reverend Terrence Thomas, um, and I'll let him do his full introduction, but he's with Bethel AME, and he's with the Ministerial Alliance, and um, I've been listening, and so um, I, I will tell you, I've been listening to his Advent season and thought it was a series and thought it was great um, to talk more broadly, uh, you know, about some of the values that he's been teaching as we approach this holiday season. But before I sort of get all formal, um, I just want to remind people that the views and the opinions of our guests are their own. And um, the whole purpose of the Trauma and Resiliency, the CU Try show, is to work to make uh, Champaign County a more healing-centered, um, robust uh connected community. I was going to use the word resilient, but uh, you, you caught me, right? Um, um, but we really want to make this a place where, and again, I'm going to steal from Bethel, where people can um, breathe and grow. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Yeah, I'm going to let uh, you introduce yourself and I'm going to try to get us on Facebook. <laughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon. It's showing Facebook on my okay. end. Um, Good afternoon. I am the Reverend Terrence Thomas. I am the current pastor of the historical Bethel AME Church in Champaign, uh, Urbana. Uh, it is the oldest African American church in the county. Uh, it is the place that has been the backbone of this community for 160 years. Uh, 2023 will be celebrating 160 years. And it is the place where who's who has, has come out of it. Um, over the past four years, I've gotten to learn the history and the place. culture of Bethel, and I would argue it's one of the pillars of the institution. For four years, I've who am who am I? Um, I am a left of center, probably Champagne's only openly, and I'm going to put openly there to be just only openly <laughs> left of center, progressive, African centered uh, pastor. And so this Advent season. Uh, Karen and I have been talking and she kind of inquired about the Advent season and to talk to the community about what Advent means. And so I'm going to do this in a couple of parts. Um, and I'm going to try, as Karen, my friend, always tells me sometimes I go fast and go over the people. But I also believe that some of this stuff is, is kind of you should know, but I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a slow it down. So for the Christian calendar, and I want to emphasize that this is for the Christian calendar, we are what's called in what's called the Advent season. It is the start of our year. Uh, um, my good friend, person near and dear to my heart, Reverend Alexis Wilson, um, you've seen her with me, you know who she is. Uh, she calls it, this is the start of the church playoffs. Bay calls it the start of the church playoffs. And so uh, Advent is the first season in the Christian calendar. It means to have an expectation. And so for the people of Israel uh, at that time, God had been silent for so many years. They've had prophecies of deliverance. Israel was a nation that was beset by community violence. It was beset by pandemics. It was beset by larger social structures, first having been conquered, uh, as always oppressed by the Philistines and the Egyptians, but ultimately it comes to a head when both kingdoms are conquered by the Assyrians in the north and the Babylonians in the south and later absorbed into the Persian Empire. And so the people of Israel were looking for a savior, right? I'm, I'm, I'm doing it this way. They were looking for a leader to help them out of this community violence, to help them out of this pandemic, to help them out of these social inequities. And so they had these prophecies that Yahweh, uh, some people call him Jehovah or have you, want to use the term, I do not use the traditional Hebrew name out of respect for our uh, Jewish brothers and sisters, but some people were looking for Jehovah to show up and Jehovah is silent, but they have these prophecies. And so Advent was the awaiting of the Messiah. And so we know that Jesus was not born in December. This is the time we observed the birth. Uh, Jesus more likely was born in the spring, but Advent is the lead up into that, right? The excitement that one will come and shake off this pandemic shake off these social inequities, shake off this trauma, shake off this community violence. And so that is Advent. Now, what does John Coltrane, a jazz musician, have to do with this? Well, John Coltrane, I'm a jazz fan, Karen, through and through. 
And I'm talking real jazz, Coltrane, Monk, Sonny Rollins, uh, Miles Davis. I ain't talking to Dave Brubeck and, 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 and Kenny G and all of that stuff that you hear in Walmart. I'm talking the jazz, America's true classical music, right? Uh, John Coltrane wrote perhaps one of the greatest jazz albums ever, A Love Supreme. And he, written, he released it in 1964. And it was written as a way of reflection upon his spiritual conversion in 57. So prior to that, Coltrane had a 10-year addiction to heroin. He ran with Miles Davis, who was a brilliant jazz performer and musician, but carried his own demons. And so in 57, he gets with his wife, Naima, who's a Muslim. He himself grew up in the church, and he has this spiritual awakening that he breaks down into four parts, uh, acknowledgement, uh, resolution, pursuance, and songs, right? And so some years later, he writes A Love Supreme. And so... I wanted to invite my church to look at a love supreme in Advent together because Coltrane was expecting something different in his life. He had reached this breaking point that many of us might be aware of. And so he reached this breaking point and he has this epiphany and he writes this great soundtrack that we know if we watch Love Jones, anything Spike Lee did, we know a love supreme uh, through the lens of Advent. And so Advent in and of itself is broken up into four parts. Now, some of the Methodist traditions, some traditions number them differently, order them differently, but in the African Methodist context, it is hope, peace, joy, and love. I've created a building block of sorts, a formula. If you don't have hope, then you probably are lacking peace because peace and hope are functioned together. I believe in a better tomorrow. I have that hope, and so it'll give me peace. If you are lacking peace, then you probably don't have joy. And joy is not happiness, it's not gladness. Joy is a spiritual condition. It's the conditions our great grandmothers and grandmothers had in spite of hard times and things going on. And they could still sing a song that'll move heavens, right? Karen, we're, we're Gen Xers, we've experienced that. Big Mama just got the news that we're, Big Mama, how are you singing? But she's singing, she ain't denying it, but she knows something great is coming. So if you don't have peace, if a community doesn't have peace, it's probably lacking joy. And then if you're lacking joy, there is no way you can tell me you have love. And so if you look at our communities, we are struggling with hope, right? Every report that comes out is something uh, deficient. Um, you, you would think Moynihan won. I think I said this at the adventure through a couple of weeks ago. You would think Moynihan won. We don't have hope. Then because we don't have hope, we don't know how to move in peace with one another and in the community. And because we like peace, this is this is a joyous, joyless time, right? I've never seen a Christmas season so joyless. And if you ain't got joy, you ain't got love. And so I put this together and talked about it through Coltrane's lens. I'm gonna be quiet because I'm sure you got questions because whenever you get I, right, smile about like that, a bazillion. So so I'm gonna so. slow you down because I think it was so I get, all of these concepts I think are rich and uh so the first question I have is probably, right, so there are people who are of faith, who are not of faith, who are from a variety of different um, maybe denominations and affiliations, and there is something about the anticipation of the season that I think might be relevant to our present moment. I mean, you set up the, the history of the Jewish people and, you know, in some ways how, what sort of the Christmas season had, has come to sort of symbolically mean for Christians. But there were so much, as you were sort of highlighting, about that time that might people might relate to our current state of affairs. Um, can you contextualize that? Uh, and I also know that there is a lot of stuff, right, when I think about the early Christian narrative so often, um, much of the anticipation of waiting for something to come, waiting for better, has been a part of the tradition, right? It, it has been a part of the, the traditions that we've all been waiting for, both in times for, for improvements and every time life is complicated with illness and sick and disease and wars and rumors of wars, people have thought like, this is it. So contextualize, talk about, connect now versus what people, how uh, to, to Advent or Advent season, how, how might people see those things working together? So I think it's important to remember, and this is, uh, I don't know who watches this, so 
this is going to be controversial in the, in the space of modern evangelical Christianity, that the Christian movement was more kingdom of God on earth than it was kingdom in heaven. And so that's why I was drawing some historical parallels. Uh, the Israelite people, um, and I'm not talking the Kyrie, Kanye trying to make connections, right? I'm talking the Israelite people were people that were displaced by an oppressive system. Um, it was a people that was constantly beset by outsiders. So even before we get to the, the conquest, they had to fight for their right to exist in peaceful. These are people that were enslaved, right? So by the time we get to the avid prophecies, these are people that had to fight the Philistines, the, the, the Midianites, they had to fight their neighbors, right? And then when the Northern Kingdoms uh, is conquered by the Assyrians, and my dates are a little off, so I'm not gonna throw out dates, I'm just giving general history. The Northern Kingdom is conquered by the Assyrians and wiped off the map. And then that's how you get the mixture of Assyrians and Jewish people. We call them Samaritans, right? Um, when then when the Southern Kingdom, the Kingdom of Judah is first conquered by the Babylonians and King Nebuchadnezzar raises their city and their temple and takes them again into slavery, exile in Babylon and leaves a puppet government of few hundred Israelites there. Um, but then the Babylonians are conquered by the Persians. And so they have this dual oppression, but something happens where uh, at the time of, of these prophecies, they just can't get free, but they keep trying to get free, right? They have their own movements. They, they never stop believing. And so they shake off the yoke. They were able to return home. They're able to kind of rebuild, but then this general named Alexander the Great comes in. Uh, Alexander the Great though, is a different kind of person. He's a conqueror, but he ain't trying to mess with them, right? He actually kind of respects them. But then Alexander the Great dies. And then, of course, we know his successor state of Rome. And Rome is a country that does not care about their history, their heritage. So Rome puts these leaders in place. We know Herod the Great and his family. They put in a puppet government. So it's the larger Roman government. Then it's Herod the Great's government. And then it's the day-to-day -day Israelite people. And if you look it sounds very familiar to the context that our grandparents lived in. So mm -hmm. a Roman soldier can pull a great grandmother out of the field and make her carry two tons. And she had to do it. If you raised your hand against a Roman soldier or raised your voice, very Jim Crow apartheid type system. And through it all, the people were looking for the promised Messiah because their prophecies in Isaiah and Amos where Jehovah has promised to restore the kingdom, restore the people to shake off this yoke. And so if for the Bible reading folks that are there, the last book of the Old Testament, I think is uh, Malachi. Mm -hmm. And that's called the silent history right now. History is not silent, but in the canon, there's no prophecies for 400 years. And then suddenly it, with, with, with the arrival of John the Baptist, uh, and he wasn't a Baptist, he's a baptizer, John the baptizer, he comes out with this proclamation, prepare or make way make way. And so they're finally hearing from God through John the, the baptizer. Now, it's important to note theologically that the audible voice of God during this time is only heard one or two times. So you hear God, and, and again, I'm not trying to be offensive to anybody. Um, speaking of the Christian canon, God speaks at Jesus's baptism. And then there's some conversations between the divine and Jesus in the, in the New Testament, but then God is silent again. And so but ultimately, if you read scripture, it flushes it out. So one of the scriptures we might know, if we remember from Sunday school and stuff, is Mary's Magnificat, her song found in Luke 1, in which she starts out, my soul cries out to the Lord, right? And it makes me rejoice. And why is Mary rejoicing? Because if you read down, she's talking about he's going to overthrow the rich. He's going to shake off the shackles of oppression. He's going to deliver the hungry. He's going to take care of the poor. He's going to do all of the things God has done in the past for us now. Nowhere is it mentioned about saving from sin and going to heaven, right? Right. Protestants add that on a little bit later. Uh, but nowhere, nowhere is that kind of put into the context. And so that's like it is for us, right? If we put the histories aligned, we see this struggle. We see this, hey, we're trying to figure this thing out. We're an oppressed people. We can't break free from this system. Every time we think we make a way, something happens. So let's just even do the last 20 years. We got a first black president, right? Mm -hmm. But then in response, we get the birthers, the right-wingers, 
uh, the 703 peacekeepers. We get all of these anti-alt-right movements that are responding to the fact that how dare you all rebuild your temple. And so if we look at the the hopelessness that that community is facing, we see that now in our community. We can't, if and you and I do a lot of these community meetings, there is never a positive report that comes out. It always makes it sound like we're living in the wild west, the last days where bulls are run through the street. And it's almost like you think we're living in some kind of walking dead construct, right? Clearly there's no peace. Clearly there's no joy. Uh, and so I think that's why I, I, I line up the context. And it's not that I don't believe in an afterlife or heaven or hell, but that wasn't their focus. And so even when you read other parts of the scripture, when John the baptizer goes out and he's speaking about the repentance of sin and cleaning yourself, he talked about you brood of vipers, right? Which was cuss words of that day. You stealing from people, you, you attacking people. It's not talking about live right now. When you die, you get something later. It's right now. You got to fix this thing. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to be a little secular <laughs> Fair. Um, because I, 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 I think the historical context and the biblical context is really fascinating. And so I'm going to make it plain in part because of why I wanted to have this conversation. Um, one, to let people know that throughout our history, however you count history, there have been periods of time, right? Sometimes I think we can be a little ahistoric and, um, and history tends to repeat itself. So we have been in moments like this for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And, and it's tempting to get hopeless, to feel powerless, to, um, to feel like things can't get better. And uh, I'm going to juxtapose for those people who haven't um, listened to John Coltrane's Love Supreme. I encourage you to go and listen because it is considered to be one of the one of the more classic best pieces of jazz, of music, of art because of its complexity of its it's not just once right like when you listen to like a, and, and people may not know this I'm going to date myself but if you listen to sort of like new jazz it might have the same sort of tempo and rhythm throughout and a love supreme is layered and just when you expect um you're at a rhythm there's something unexpected it 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 embodies the spirit of jazz, which I think that the season, uh, you know, so my hope message is the season is in all of the complexity, in all of the unpredictability, in all of the mirrored history, there can be magic and hope and anticipation. And it is that movement towards looking for the anticipation that I think we are all called to be looking for it. So don't always just sort of be looking at what isn't possible, but to keep your eyes on possibility, hope, and future. So history repeats itself over and over again. And the, th the tools that people have used historically, I'm gonna go back to your tools, but the things that people have used historically will help you weather the storm. And last but not least, to think about life, life in community, life in this moment as jazz and not as um, sort of music that is supposed to be the same without complexity and layers. And I don't think we get life without complexity and layers until we're like not here. <laughs> I don't think that that's the point. Um, and I, I know I'm, I'm say one more thing and then I'm going to turn it back over to you. But I I get my like ring alarm. Right. Like and, and, and it gives you this neighborhood watch where people are like somebody was like walking across my yard. Does it you know, and, and, and there's like this hyper vigilance of people looking for people to do wrong, to cause harm, to, you know, violate. And when you do that, I think it reinforces um, powerless and hopelessness and the lack of connection and community. And again, we've been here before and we've got some tools to help overcome. So that's my spiel. Where, how, is, where is am it, I? You're actually, you're actually on point. Okay. And so 
not even getting religious. I, I, I'll keep it. Love Supreme, the first track is acknowledgement, yeah. right? Can we acknowledge where we are? Yeah. And with anything in life, uh, you got to be able to acknowledge a problem before you can solve the problem. But also you have to acknowledge the joy, right? Yeah. Um, I often hate saying this because, uh, you know, I've gotten in trouble saying this in other spaces, but I come from the city that wildness reigns supreme. I, I lived three blocks from a place where you did not walk if you went from that neighborhood at seven o'clock. Is it is it hard down here? Yeah, but I don't think it's that. I don't think we comped in, in the 90s. You know what I'm saying? Is it hard for our context? Acknowledged. But what I've often asked in city council meetings and other places is when we talk about where there's shootings, and I had to learn to do this in Chicago. This would make me break out of my, oh my gosh, Chicago's going to hell. Where there's a shooting, I immediately ask how many places was there not a shooting? And by no means am I saying the shootings should happen or it's it's not a bad thing. I'm saying though, is if you have a week, seven days, and one of those days is trash, but the other six days are beautiful, I think you had a good week with just a hiccup, right? Now, if we get to a point where it's five of those days, then you can probably say, okay, this is a bad week. But how we tell the story, right? And our ancestors understood this. And this is why, you know, growing up, we didn't talk from the negative framework. This is why scholars in the 60s, the young activists and scholars refused to read, re talk about victim analysis, right? We make ourselves the victim like we're deficient. And so can we acknowledge the truth of where we are? And so I remember when the license plate reader fight was happening, everybody was hyper, oh my God, we got to bring in the troops and oh, we need tanks on the street. Not for champagne, like it ain't that. Is it, it just requires some creativity, people to stop fighting over money and some other things. But if you consistently tell yourself you're trash, eventually you will believe you're trash, right? And so the second part of a love supreme is, is, is resolution. Are we resolving to make this better? Or have you resolved that this is the best it's going to get and I can't do nothing else? Uh, I've had some health challenges over the past year. And for the longest time, I resolved it is what it is until one day I decided to resolve that it wasn't going to be what it is and began to correct those things and began to start monitoring my weight and working on these things. And so what are you resolved to do? And so for us doing the nonprofit work, doing the community work, are we resolved that we're going to put money to the side and build something different? Or are we resolving we're going to keep on going with the status quo because that's what pays the bills? Right. Are we resolving that we want to work with people who may not agree with us? Or are we resolving we're going to stay in our silos? Yeah. Because I got a little power in my silos. I got a little click. Then it was a, a pursuance, right, to make a plan. Our, our ancestors had a plan. What's the plan? What's a real, tangible, manageable plan? And I know people throw rocks at you sometimes when you, when you always bring this up. Sometimes I want to throw a rock like, Karen, you're killing our dream. But you still have to have a plan, right? And so acknowledge, what's the plan? And so... Uh, Reverend Wilson always yells, what are we going to do, right? That's the thing when, when they, what are we going to do? What's the plan? And it drives me crazy because dreamers, you know, Curtis Mayfield said we can deal with rockets and dream, but reality, what does that mean? So dreamers sometimes struggle with planners, but we need planners. Yeah. So we say we're going to feed 50,000 people in Champagne. Well, do we, have, do we have the need for that? Uh, <laughs> when we develop in our programs, we're going to feed 200,000 black kids. It's 200 black kids in the community. Like, so what's your plan? Because unrealistic expectations, unrealistic planning, then you fail and then you lose your resolution. You lose your acknowledgement. Right. And so then the last thing is a uh, psalm. Psalm is the song, a declaration, how you live your life. And so when people often ask me, I think you're right, because the season I wasn't with the Alliance. Right. Now sit at the head of that table. What brought you back? Well, I had to live my psalm out. I couldn't be talking about I'm pro-Black, I love Black folks, I love Black Jesus, et cetera, but I won't talk to the half of the Black pastors in the city. That's yeah. um, without good cause, right? Because there are sometimes you have to you have to remove people from the community, it's harmful, but without good cause. So I will put that asterisk there. I, I, we don't agree theologically, okay, and but are we committed to making the community better? And so can we find that common space? And so I think that what John Coltrane's life and the Love Supreme did is show that throughout history, We've had to do this, right? So we even go back to Sister Harriet had to acknowledge, man, slavery sucks. I got to get up out of here. And then she had to 
to resolve that I'm going to be free and then come up with a plan to be free and then lived her life in such a way that promoted freedom. Let me tell you, Ella Baker, listen, this stuff is horrible. I'm going to resolve to be better and I'm going to teach young people not to follow up behind us because remember, she broke the SELC hold uh, and I'm going to live my life in such a way, Fannie Lou Hamer. And so how do we how do we do that? And I think that one of the things uh, that has happened is we become ahistorical. Mm -hmm. And I definitely see this among millennial and Gen Z uh, activists. Uh, there's this newness. I have this new idea, this new model, and you don't. Uh, you might have tweaked it for the modern era, as, as my Bible say, for such a time as this. But Black Lives Matter, non-hierarchical leadership, ain't nothing but Fannie New and Ella Baker retooled, ain't nothing but <laughs> Sojourner Truth and Harriet retooled, ain't nothing but David Walker retooled, and so on and so forth. And so I think that when we get I past- mean, Right, I think even, not even have to go back that Black Lives Matter is Ida B. Wells. It's all of the anti-lynching, it's the why the NAACP got founded that people don't understand, right? The, the origins, the etology, right, was, um, although it's now considered sort of mainstream, it was revolutionary at the time to, to speak to the lynching, the mass incarceration, the mass um, violations of Black women and Black men that were happening post-Reconstruction. Again, we have been here before um, in, in so many different ways. So I, I want to. So we're having this sort of larger political, social conversation, which is powerful. So I'm hoping people are contextualizing um, because when we think about the kind of community, world, society, and we're having this conversation about CU or Champaign County, but we could be thinking, right? We could widen our lens and think about this happening in so many places. If I just think about this past election season, you know, we were bombarded with, you know, crime is awful, you're not safe, the economy is bad, the bottom is falling out, um, you know, on one end and on the other, you know, so we just a lot of fear and worry and also things to reinforce powerless and helplessness. And um, I, was, I was also hoping that people hear that this John Coltrane path or this Advent path where you acknowledge where you are as we move into the new year, that you sit down and really do some honest reflections of where are you? And this is across the board. This is for black body people, white body people, right? Like re regardless of where you are in the di diaspora, really to acknowledge like in, in all of the complexity because I don't think any of us have sort of arrived to this promised land but if two years ago after George Floyd you made commitments to yourself and the community or maybe you made because of COVID some commitments to your family and your community or maybe to employers or whatever it was because we've had a lot of transition and loss this has been a time of right refining for a lot of people where are you now what do you have yes you've got to acknowledge maybe what feels different but like the present focus is here right part one and then once you've acknowledged that, right, then we sort of walk through this path of healing, right? And um, John Coltrane's Love Supreme sort of walks you through the path of healing. Where it, what brings you sort of joy? Joy not as happiness, but joy as in I am connected to people. Um, I am doing things that are meaningful. I am doing things that matter and are purpose filled. Um, I, um, I'm been having a conversation, and, and so I'll get to the last two points. But I, I want to get your feedback. I've been having a conversation with uh, with a friend and a colleague, and um, the person asked me, like, "What do you worry about?" And I say all the time, "I worry about not making impact." Like. I worry about dying with like dreams on the vine or not having given the best or made a difference. And uh, my friend goes, 
those are so ethereal. Like, why are you worried about those kinds of sort of things? And for me, we're all put on the planet to just do that, right? Like to make a difference, to have an impact, to um, leave sort of footprint, not legacy, but really like think about, did I say hi to the grocery lady? Did I make someone feel better? Did I help make people feel seen and heard? And every day I'm sort of committed to doing that. And I think in this journey, right, that that's what we're asked to be looking for. Like, how do you do that with purpose? And how do you find joy and connection in community and identity and value? So um, I think you, 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 you touched on something. I, I do think that, uh, you know, it, so I understand their, their concern, like that's kind of like existential, right? But at the same time, it's not. I think so often the way this thing is set up, we are so focused on our very real tangible material needs that we forget that the little things actually can make us better and stronger to fight for the bigger things. Yeah. And so if, I, if, if I'm if i able to be kind to someone, if I'm able to operate in a space of hope, peace, joy, and love, uh, then, then I'm not broken. Then I'm not downtrodden, right? Then I'm not so disconnected from the vine, from the community that I can't come together. Uh, what, what you're speaking of is something that we have to get back to, and that is a communal mindset. Um, one of my, 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 my concerns as a scholar, as an activist, is that I'm seeing a lot of Atlas Shrug kind of mentality, uh, Frederick Nietzsche kind of mentality show up as progressive thought, and it scares the living hell out of me. So when I see young activists talk about get the bag, right? We talked about recently, Deion Sanders, get the bag, forget the community, get your bag. I don't know, somewhere, man, Aaron Rand is smiling at that. Somewhere Nietzsche is smiling at that. And when you consider that both of those philosophies undergird white supremacy, right? Nazism, the Third Reich, this hyper-capitalist American, have we taken that poison? So when I when I hear activists and organizations take anti-intellectual stands, I want to be like, like I'm them elites and at the college. Well, that's as white supremacy as you get. Who says, you don't even worry about the closing books. That's the Northern elite stuff. Nah, man, you, you, you got to know what you're talking about. So there's something to the to your position where I was going was this, 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 it's not pie in the sky. I want my life to mean something beyond my bank account because tomorrow they can get rid of currency and then what is left? Yeah. Tomorrow the socialists can actually win. They give me the money, everything is free. And then what's left? Well, how I treated somebody, right? Uh, People, we, we we do human help work. You can give out things all the time, but I dare say the ones that actually remember and love us are the ones that we treated with kindness and like humans. You know, I've given people things, uh, people coming to the church, pass, can I have it? Right, hey man, get away from me because I'm tired. Here's $50, get away from me. Did I do an impact or did I just talk some kind of, you know, here you go, here's some crumbs. Well, the ones that I sit and talk to, learn this story, come up with solutions. And so I think that that's for a community. We have to wrestle with that, right? Um, are we looking at this thing through the wrong lens? Even in our own personal life, I'm a hospital chaplain. By no means am I ever saying to get trauma, the reality, your lights when they get cut off, et cetera. All that's very real. But then sometimes you got to put it over and against. So my lights are cut off. And this is all really trying to keep us sane in this season. And it's not meant to be a solution, but how not to go crazy. My life's going to get cut off. My baby daddy acting stupid. But you know what? I can go to my mama's house and have a good meal. Okay, maybe I can't go to my mama's house. You know what? I can call Miss Karen up. She'll bring me some lunch. She'll talk to me. I can still end up with a good day. And you know what? I'm going to pass that on to somebody else. And so these are examples, right? Are our young people wilding out? Is gun violence real? Yeah. But I don't know, man. I read the news because every day I see some kind of young person doing something in the newspaper. Right. Every day in our churches, we got young people standing up. So what do we celebrate? I argue our biggest problem is the community is that while we pay appropriate attention to violence, we also lionize that stuff. Right. And so I grew up at a time where the community violence was real. We acknowledge it. We talked about it. But you weren't getting buildings and streets named that you either if you was in certain kind of behaviors like we just got to start. So acknowledgement. Right. Self-accountability. 
uh, who we gonna talk about. Sad that that happened, but I got a baby over here. It's that old Chris Rock joke. We put more into folks getting out of jail than we do people graduating with PhDs. And I think we gotta have a hard conversation about that. I don't know how to, how to find the justice in that moment, but it also personally can help you recontextualize where your life is. And I'm speaking from experience. I'm not giving anybody any formula. Um, I was talking to my sons on the drive up, as, 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 as Karen didn't tell you all, I'm on vacation. This is my middle son's birthday yesterday, and I'm here seeing my youngest. And one of the drive ups we had was I said, you know, I came to the place where I realized that my life was good. I never had to sleep in the cold, didn't grow up with the projects. Uh, did I have some rough paths? Yeah, but I think a lot of that was because what I did, not necessarily how I was raised. And so I'm going to kind of stop giving my dad and mom a hard time about what I didn't have. Because what I didn't have is eclipsed by what I did have. Mm -hmm. And so that acknowledgement, that resolution, pursuing that in my day-to-day -day life. Um, I'm not a positive passivity. You won't see me posting about joy and all of that, trying to hide my grief. But the fact of the matter is, looking at it from the other side, yeah. And I think we as a community in this holiday season, when everybody's posting their grief, their trips, their gifts, uh, on the other side, when everybody's posting these downer messages, what do I have, right? And so to tie it all back in, and when Mary's Magnificent, yes, all of this, the soldiers are trash. They messing with us. We ain't been free in 400 years. It's hard out here, but my soul rejoices because the divine, whoever you call them, however you identify, has done so much before. I have no reason not to believe that won't show up again. Yeah. And, so, and to find your magic. So acknowledge, find joy in connection and community and meaning and the focus on the what is left behind and how you make meaning. Um, we just had a show, a, a documentary and we're gonna sort of make it a community event uh, called Mission Joy, which uh, features Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama talking about sort of joy. And this was one of their, their sort of signature statements was, you know, both live through all kinds of oppression, but it was being able to contextualize it and make meaning and turn it into purpose and think about what's left behind, not in a way that ignores the pain, right? Because we need to use that as a catalyst to make sure that we're curative because, right, we don't want to, again, be a historic where we're not like aware that apartheid was bad and that there was a lot of loss. But we also want to say, and then what came out of that? What is left behind? How do I continue to sort of make a difference and have an impact? And so for people who are like going into the holiday season, and I don't want to minimize the sadness. Um, I was just reading about a recent suicide of like Ellen's DJ, right? Like I don't want to, and I read another study that black women's suicide rates are going up, black men in the middle-class suicide rates are going on. I get um, I guess, I, I, yeah, I've heard more suicides this last couple of years of Black sort of affluent middle-class people than I've ever heard in my, my adult life. Um, so I get that there is a lot of loss and lament and there's community violence and there are economic pressures and there is also the chance to lean into community. There is the chance to reach out. There is the chance to see yourself as your brother and sister's keepers. There's the chance to think about um, re-narrating, right? Like um, where were those protective factors? Where were those buffers, um, I, right? Like bad things can happen, but when you maybe had people in your community or people who cared for you or people who looked out for you or people who were consistently available in your life, those are the things that keep you going, right? And, and, and we need to understand, especially people of color, especially black people, that black joy is a weapon. And it's something I want to read at the end that I wrote a couple of years ago when the first Black Panther came out that speaks to this and I always remind people, nobody's afraid of our fear, our anger, Afro-pessimism. Um, and when I read it, if you'll allow me to, maybe one minute hot read, it'll encapsulate what you're saying. 
And as I said, I wrote this around the time of the first Black Panther, because if you remember, and we kind of did it with the second one too, but the first one, there was a lot of joy in this moment, right? We was playing dress up. We was imagining what a, what a free African society looked like. And then there's all these, these voices that suddenly start coming up like, y'all, there's real problems out there in the world. And we don't care, like just kill joy, right? And was, well, nobody's always smiling. But this is what I wrote in response. And I posted this on Facebook back in 2018. Black joy is a weapon, y'all. This is why they used to get pissed when slaves sung to endure the horrors of chattel slavery. Why they hated the hymns during our many mass protests we sang to show our determination. Why they hate the cookout despite constantly trying to come. Why they're constantly trying to convince you that the black church is a horrible entity that needs to fall. Why they tried to kill hip hop since its inception. Why they try to get us not to kind our, send our kids to HBCUs. All of these things produce black joy. You know what joy is a product of? Hope. Do you know what hope produces? Imagination. You know what imagination produces? Inspiration. Do you know what inspiration produces? Action. And guess what action produces? Liberation. In this present darkness, and quite honestly, a couple of decades before now, we have been told that joy is problematic. Joy is cooning. Joy does nothing that, but I'm sorry, joy does nothing but help the neoliberals. We have bought into the notion that joy is a problem so much so that many of us reject that in favor of numbness that comes with the present darkness in which we find ourselves and why so many of us would rather be here than in a different space under the guise of ideological purity. Joy is a weapon and we forgot how to use it. This is why I'm loving this moment around Black Panther. This is pure joy. This is the light side of the force. This is the fuel in which things get started. Simple joy. It doesn't matter that Marvel made it. It doesn't matter if you ain't got a passport. It doesn't matter if none of the false equivalencies people try to use to kill this moment because they wanna be fake deep and in darkness. No, this is black joy, plain and simple, and I am happy for us. And so that speaks to what you're saying. When we, I, I, I thought about that, no slave was ever whipped for singing uh, a sad song, right? We, they got mad when they, how you gonna sing for happiness and liberation when we got you oppressed? Uh, that's why they tried to kill hip hop. Why are y'all partying in the seventies in this, in this depression, this economic recession, and y'all have created a whole genre of music, right? That's why they forever trying to get us to turn on our institutions. And so I think that you're right in the middle of all this. You can acknowledge the present darkness, but you cannot lose your joy. You cannot lose your hope, your peace, and your love. Um, they Nobody has done a study to discredit Afro-pessimism. Ain't nobody coming for Ty Nessie Colt. Yeah, okay, y'all Negroes is mad. But when you start writing real stuff about overcoming trauma and et cetera, et cetera, then everybody want to come against that. And I think we've bought into that hype, that sadness. I think that uh, as much as I understand why, where it came from, American gods that saying anger, get shit done, excuse the language, ain't necessarily true. Because they ain't never been afraid of your anger. Even Huey Newton finally said, ain't nobody scared of our guns. You know what they're afraid of? Our free breakfast program a free ambulance service, a free literary program. That's when they start burning stuff down. When we was out there marching with guns, they was laughing because they knew they had more guns. What are these 12 dudes with, with six shooters going to do? But when we start feeding the babies in the morning, and so ain't nobody, you know, I, I, I've told activists around here, nobody's afraid that you cuss us out and you cuss out the mayor and poverty pimps and all that. We shrug our shoulders and child, I guess. But when you put something tangible on the floor, that's when people notice. <laughs> Absolutely, right? And so I would hope, um, I just definitely want to give, I, first of all, loved, loved, loved the writing and post. I should, if you're, you give us permission, I would love to post it under our thread again, because that was just a beautiful piece. And I would hope that people, and we didn't talk about this, but in all of our traditions, all of our traditions and, and um, people who are white body, you have traditions too. There are probably stories of joy and overcoming. And I know that there are so many social pressures that promote numbness and not acknowledging and pretending like those stories don't exist. Um, and that is to your detriment because um, part of, I think, what creates some of the tensions cross-racial, cross-cultural, cross-class is when people disown parts of their story. Um, mm -hmm. It is hard for you to appreciate it in my story. So, you know, the tradition, me wanting to keep and embrace 
um, stories of resilience and remembrance or um, cultural expressions or whatever, if you allow me to have mine, um, then you can reclaim yours and have room to, to find and rediscover yours. Because in this journey, right, many people compromised and gave up the things that fortified and grounded them. And this moment is calling you to reclaim some of that. So if your um, Irish grandmother had traditions of chopping potatoes in a certain way and roasting, um, you know, making brisket or whatever the tradition is, I, I bet you, you might have some stories of watching and witnessing and seeing that. And if not, right, if you can't remember or can't recall because there was fragmentation, right, go back and try to rediscover. I mean, because I think that is also part of what's stopping us from connecting is that people think that there's only one way to be. And that only one way to be means giving up culture, giving up identity, giving up community, um, giving up, um, right, the jazz of our lives. And instead, we all need to go back and do some reclaiming. Mm -hmm. I, I, I definitely agree with that. And I mean, they do. Uh, they do. They uh, I, first thing popped in my head when you said that was Fourth of July. Oh, yeah. right? that, that, that's, that's, that's the holiday. Yeah. Uh, the patriarch, patri patriotic hearted holidays yeah. are, are those for other cultures. Uh, every culture has them. So yeah. they might have dead, dead like, and you should reclaim those. And, and there, there, there are even more cultural traditions that, um, right, because, right, I don't want to be political in this moment, but, you, you know, if you just think about even 4th of July, most of the people who live on the planet wouldn't be considered to be people who were represented in that event because, mm -hmm. you know, we were pretty class based society and most of the sacrifice that most people's families made around work around you know labor around building just didn't get acknowledged right and um because mm. they were invisible people too it's why we kind of have all of the complexities that we have so re reclaim refine repurpose your joy um work on connections and then think about, right, this is the bridge. What do you want to be different? And how are you going to plan for it? So what do you want to be different um, in your own personal life? What do you want to be different in your community? Um, you know, we've been having for the last few years, these community conversations after gun violence, where, you know, the conversation is always like, you know, how do you feel about it? And then what do you want? And, you know, and frequently people are like, okay, I want it to be better. And like, and somehow fairy dust, and I'm not minimizing the, I want a world with where I can just do whatever I want. And that isn't unfortunately the world that we have. I mean, you could be shot at the grocery store. So the thought that somehow your neighborhood block is going to be somehow magically more safer, but you could think about, well, what are those things that you as an individual, you as uh, two or three people in a neighborhood could do, make a commitment to that might create more feelings of belonging or safety, but you've got to plan for that. It doesn't just mm -hmm. happen. You can't wish it away and it can't be somebody else's responsibility because we all have to put some you know, sweat equity. So it's everything yeah. from, you know, showing up at meetings to voting in every election, even ones that you think are inconsequential that really can make a difference. It's um, making phone calls. It's maybe helping out at your school. It's maybe, you know, or, but I want you to think if this, if the, the neighborhood, the block, the family you're in isn't what you anticipate it would be, what are you going to do about it rather than just lament or cut off? Because that's the other thing. I think we're in a, a time where people feel like the solution is just to either ignore or to compartmentalize or incarcerate, right? Incarcerate in so many different ways rather than I want to live in community. And how do we sort out the, the messiness of that in ways that are restorative and healing? 
And um, I, think, and I yeah. think you're right. Like, again, there's something to the planners that, and, and I, I used to be a planner. I'm trying to get back. You know, we want our community better. We got to do something. Well, what, what, right? And it's grounded. It's grounded in tangible, realistic things. So, you know, when people, and I, and I am as left to center as they come, you know, we want a socialist economy in the community. All right, that's going to take some measures that we may not be ready for. So until then, what are we willing to do? Uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, every, nobody should have to pay rent. I agree, but, you know, how are we going to make that realistic? Um, you know, and, we need and, programs. And some landlords are, prop, are, you know, people who own property got to pay the bill. How's that going to happen? <laughs> You know, we got to come up with a program for the youth. Like, okay, what program for the youth, right? What are we teaching them? Are we polishing, you know, you know what and calling it diamonds? Uh, are we just, you know, teaching them how to wear shirt and ties and act right, but no life skills? Um, you know, somebody in the community said to me, how many more basketball and rapping programs we got? What else do we have to offer? And I think that we have to get to that place and have that conversation but that requires some acknowledgement and some resolutions. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> so I think that we just, it's its not an easy fix. And I think ultimately that's what I would land. Sometimes, you know, things will be silent, but that don't mean things aren't in motion. Sometimes things will be, everybody's breathing. That don't mean things aren't in motion. And how do we get to that place, you know, where we can finally say, well, someday we'll all be free, mean it and work towards it. I love it. And uh, I have sort of a vision, again, having listened to your series, um, that that this could be something that people could do with family, in family, in community, right? To think about sort of sitting down at a table with the people that you love and care for and acknowledge where you are, right? Mm -hmm. um, to maybe do some uh, reparative process or um, right sort of reflection and then to engage in some purposeful planning about who we are as a family, who who are we in relationship to other people and to really kind of think about that being the chart and the pathway forward, how different our communities could feel how different we could feel with each other, how different, um, how more supported and connected we could be, uh, and uh, right, and 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 be prepared for this next season um, in ways that are fortifying and edifying. Um, any thoughts about that? No, I think you're. I think you 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 summed it up nicely. We, it's it is a blueprint. It is an all encompassing kind of task. And I, I, I don't want to be hyper spiritual, but I do think it requires a mindset change. It does. And, and everything you're talking about requires connection to something else beyond the self. It requires, you have to understand you're part of a tapestry. Mm -hmm. you're, you're part of, of a tapestry. Then, the, the 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 live exceptionalism is what separates you. Um, I've not been here long. I've, I've given four years of my, my very young life, but I think that that's what tripped this community up. We're sharing pain or banner. We're different, but we're not, right? Because we're still part of a larger tapestry weaved into American society. So while it might look different and feel different, um, it's still the same old dish, man. And so understanding that, <laughs> can help give us some baseline. So how did other communities with similar context handle whatever they were facing? How did larger communities, what can we pick up, right? Um, but ultimately it's a, where's your soul in this matter? And, and I'm talking S-O-U-L and capital S-O-U-L, uh, where's your soul in this matter? And so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, you, you, you have to really earnestly believe, and especially, and just to come back to the personal in this holiday season, you can acknowledge it's rough. You can, it can very well be rough. Um, sometimes it gets overbearing, like the young brother who killed himself. But in the aftermath of all of that, joy still comes in the morning. 
you know, um, somebody got free and it could be you if you if you're pushing towards it. And uh, that is actually really profound and beautiful. And just to continue to reiterate, joy is not happiness. It's not. It is, it is peace. It is purpose. It is meaning making. It is a practice, right? It is a, a skill that you can constantly work and cultivate in the midst of in spite mm -hmm. of, and to use your words, it is an act of defiance. And so uh, I thank you so much for taking time out Anytime. of your vacation to have this conversation. I am hoping it was a little inspirational uh, for people who find this later. Um, and I hope that uh, people will go and check out the series, but also go discover or rediscover a love supreme and to think about um i know when we think about trauma healing we think about surfing but i love people to think about the a love supreme as the way that you navigate through through life and recover and feel restored so thank Indeed. you thank you thank you anything for try anything for try <laughs> Well, be well, and uh, we uh, I, and I can't wait. So, if you can send that to me, if you're okay, I'll repost. I'll tag you in the you. post. So just check okay. check your Facebook. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Right. Thank you.